Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. And before we start, I wanted to ask you all to give another very big warm welcome to the amazing Face Ringold. Uh, And Jana Peel and I and uh, all our teams at the Serpentine are so delighted to welcome you to tonight's talk. It's our dream come true to have uh, Faces exhibition at the Serpentine, which started uh, yesterday. We're going to talk tonight about the many dimension of uh, Faces practice. We're delighted to be back here at Conway Hall uh, after the uh, Symposium Rides to the City, which we organized here last year, which was an all-day forum dedicated to generating conversations about the future of arts education and the city. And we're very delighted that this project also will continue now in many other parts of London. We're working closely with Barking Dagenham. We're delighted to welcome tonight also the artist Suzanne Lacey, who is joining us actually in a year-long role as the Education and Projects Curator, uh, helping us to shape the future of the learning program. Please give a very warm welcome to Suzanne Lacey. Faith, as you all know, is a legendary artist, has uh, 23 honorary doctorates, 80 awards, has had hundreds of exhibitions all over the world, yet this is the very first time that Faith's work is shown in London, and it's the very first survey exhibition also of the work in, uh, in Europe. We're going to talk tonight about the beginnings, but we're also going to talk about the amazing work actually Faith is realizing uh, today, and I just wanted to say a few thank yous and welcome here very specially the amazing writer uh, and also daughter of Faith, author of our catalog, the brilliant Michelle Ballas. A very warm welcome, Michelle. <laughs> I wanted to also say how very grateful we are to Dorian Bergen, who is here tonight and has worked, of course, with FACE for more than 25 years. A very warm welcome to Dorian! <laughs> we also have here Grace Matthews, who has for more than 20 years been FACE's main assistant, and we wanted to thank her for her expert advice. A big applause for Grace! We also wanted to say how grateful we are to Pippi Hutzworth, who is here tonight for facilitating so many loans for the exhibition and introducing us to FACE some years ago. A very warm welcome to Pippi. Yay. All our thanks go to matchesfashion.com, who have made this exhibition possible. Daniel Rajokin, Patrick Waugh, please give them a very, very warm welcome. I also wanted to thank the Serpentine Dream Team, who has made this exhibition a reality. Deborah Smith, Interim Heads of Program. Melissa Blanchflower, who has worked with FACE every single day over the last 12 months. <laughs> and also a big applause for the team, Natalia Grabowska, Mike Gorn, and Joel Bahn. And of course, we are very grateful to our live programming team, Kostas Stasinopoulos, who has organized today's program. A big applause also for Lucia Pietro Justi, Holly Shuttleworth, Kamal Akri, Laura Norman, and Laura McFarlane. A big round of applause. And now, before we start, another big round of applause for Faith Ringel. <laughs> Now, Faith, I wanted to begin with the beginning, and I wanted to ask you how it all began, how you came to art, or how art came to you. Well, I think a lot of young children love art. And if given the opportunity to practice and to do art, 
they will. And if they're encouraged to move on and given the opportunity again, after they reach, what, say 12 or 13 years old, they will continue. And I got all of that. As I had asthma as a child, and I didn't go to school uh, the first grade in kindergarten. So I could do my art, and I did. My father brought me my first easel, and uh, I kept making it. However, I, I didn't just do it. I became an artist, which was different to me. I didn't understand about being an artist. I just liked to do art, but I had to figure it out, because that's a... Becoming an artist is a real, what, challenge. So I had to change from doing to being. Yeah, I got a lot of help from so many people. And I, I have so many people to thank. And know? there was, of course, a whole community. You mentioned in a previous interview we did that Harlem was a, a very protective place. It was a, an extended family, and you met so many also great artists in the 1930s. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the Harlem of the 30s, where you grew up, and some of these amazing, well, amazing encounters? <coughs> yeah, I was born in 1930, and many of the artists lived all around me. Jacob Lawrence was one. Uh, and uh, it was fascinating to meet these people just walking around and being like normal neighbors. Um, I never really understood how great they were until I became older and read books about them. It was amazing how they didn't want to be, uh, you know, if you saw them in a restaurant or something, they didn't want you to come up and say, oh, oh. They, they wanted to just act like they were everybody else. And I, I thought that was fabulous, in a sense. But there was a lot of artists and musicians living in Harlem at the time of the 30s, 40s, 50s. And um, I was much influenced by them to do something creative, to, to tell our story, to... Um, to give some history and some permanence to who we are as black people in America. So I became an artist. Uh, after encouragement from so many people, I went to college, <clears throat> and I didn't realize that going to college meant you were going to be something. I just, well, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> No, I didn't, because it was, it was uh, you know, I had to go myself, because when you, when you uh, sign in to college, or uh, your parents don't do that for you, you do it. And that's, uh, it's kind of difficult to say, I'm going to be an artist. You know, so I went in saying, I'm going to do art. Found out that the school I was trying to go to was really a boys' school. And when I heard that, uh, is the City College of New York, incidentally. And I, when I heard that it was a boys' school, I, I just wouldn't accept it, because I used to see all these boys coming up out of the subway at 145th Street, going up the hill and down to the City College. And I just thought, oh, boy, that's the college I want to go to, not realizing it was a boys' college and that I wanted to go a, uh, I wanted to get a, 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 a degree <clears throat> in art, and that I couldn't. I had to get a degree teaching art. So, okay, so they finally tried to explain it to me. And uh, as a matter of fact, they didn't even say that. They finally got somebody to come in and tell me that this was a boys' school, yes, but you could, if you were a girl, a woman, you could uh, go to City College and uh, become a teacher. So you would 
uh, what? Major in education, major in art, and minor in education. Yes, you could do that. Isn't that interesting how they didn't really think of teaching for women as a, a major uh, endeavor? That's interesting that they would let the women go there to teach, but nothing else. Well, I grabbed it because most of my family were teachers. Uh, they couldn't get jobs in New York or in the North or, or the South mainly, doing anything else but teaching. And they all went to college. because We were told, you grow up, you get out of high school, you gotta go to college. So I knew that, but I didn't know what was I gonna get, a liberal arts degree in art? What was I gonna do? Anyway, I did it. And uh, it's been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Enriching, interesting, and I think wonderful because there's so many people who have helped me. And one of the person, like one of the theory. artists who, who inspired you, because you met so many amazing people, but you once told me that it was Jacob Lawrence who maybe was the artist you admired most because you said he was yeah. a master artist, but also somebody who paved the way for so, so many artists. He gave courage yeah. to many artists. Can you tell us a little bit about your memories of the amazing Jacob Lawrence? And, well, and I was in an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, and I took my daughters to it. Uh, and in it was Jacob Lawrence. I was so excited. This was, oh my God, this was a long time ago. And I don't even know whether, whether she remembers that exhibition, do you? And uh, um, in the show, it was a, it was a show of African-American artists. It was a long time ago. And I went and I took my two daughters with me and I ran into Jacob Lawrence at the show and he came up and said hello to me. And I said, oh, Jacob Lawrence, oh, I said, I love your work. And he said, and I love yours. And I said, wow, you know my work? And uh, he said, yes, I know your work. And I was shocked, you know? I mean, how could he know my work? I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not into anything. So he knows my work. I was very excited and I wanted my two daughters to, to meet him. And, uh, and then I became to, to know him a little better. He, he didn't leave, live too far away from me in Harlem. Uh, I loved his, his, uh, his lifestyle, the way he had put his life together. He really fought to get the recognition that he did. He did his work. And I was very, very much inspired by Jacob Lawrence, knowing that he had never had a job that was not involved with art. He never had a, what some people would say, a real job. And uh, that, that was fascinating to me. Yeah, so, and then I also met Bearden and uh, a lot of the other artists. Because I would just go up to them and say, look, my name is Faith Ringold. Or it wasn't Ringold, it was Faith Jones. And, uh, you know, I love your art, and uh, I'm here to, uh, to see more of it. Some of them didn't like it. They thought, you know, what are you running up to me telling me you introducing yourself? I don't want to know you, you know? <laughs> but I didn't care because I wanted, I wanted to meet these people. And I, I wasn't, my husband used to tell me when we would go to shows and all, and I would run up to this one and that one, and he would say, you know, you need to stop doing that. <laughs> he said, you know, you don't get embarrassed or upset when they say, back off from you and 
and say they don't know anything, you know, it really show that they don't know anything about you and don't want to know you? I said, no, they, it's okay, one day they will. <laughs> so I, I didn't care. I was just excited about the fact that I had met them and that I was in a place with them. And I just, that's why I used to come to ACA all the time, because I wanted to see those people who had gone before me and had done such a beautiful job of showing the what? The culture, uh, aesthetics of African-American artists. And so that was always in my mind. I didn't care. They couldn't insult me. There was no way. And then, of course, there was also the inspiration from Guernica. You told us that uh, Guernica was a very important encounter for you. Could you tell us a little bit about that, how you encountered Guernica and, and what that meant for you? Well, Guernica uh, is um, <coughs> a painting by Pablo Picasso in which he's showing the riots uh, that took place in Spain, huh? Civil War, yeah. Yeah, and, and he, um, he, he was such a wonderful artist in so many other ways. He had a whole room at the Museum of Modern Art. And that room had Guernica in it. And I used to just go there and go there and take my daughters there. I just loved looking at his work. There was a certain power in it that overwhelmed me. Uh, at one point when, um, whose name? The guy who uh, had the bad situation in, in, in Spain. What? Franco, right? Yeah. Franco uh, died. And uh, Picasso decided that he would not let uh, Guernica go back to Spain until Franco was no longer around because he, he might destroy the painting. And because um, it was a, a really a struggle, a fight, a war uh, that they had. And so when, when Guernica uh, left Spain and came, no, when Guernica left America and came to Spain, the U.S. I, United States Information Agency sent me to, um, to Spain, and I think I had a, a, a piece in a show. They had shows and all for, for, um, for uh, Picasso, and uh, I think that I went there to share in the United States uh, and Picasso in some some way, and and actually ended up. Um, I didn't meet Picasso, no, but I met so many people, and it was so wonderful and exciting that that I was there. And the United States Information Agency sent me there. There used to be a lot of programs in which artists got sent to different parts of the world. And it's of course so um, fascinating that now you know people uh, visit your work at MoMA in a similar way yeah. how you would have visited yeah. Veronica at the time. And I'm interested because you mentioned uh, the riots, and of course there is a very direct connection from Guernica to your American People series. And uh, they are really the first important group of work in the exhibition here at the Serpentine, one of your seminal group of works. And I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about how the American People series started. You once said in, a, in an interview that in 63 you went with your children to Martha's Vineyard and somehow it began there. Can you tell us about the beginnings of the American uh, People series and what, what triggered that? Well, I wanted to do art that reflected my uh, experience, my American experience. 
And so I created the American People series. Uh, and it was kind of like a rule that um, black people shouldn't paint white people. And that, well, white people could paint black people, but it was usually a negative portrayal. And so I decided that I was going to show the look of what I saw and how it was in America at the time. And so I started painting my American People series in 19, what, 63? 63. Yeah. 63. And uh, I continued it on until... Um, 67? Hale Woodbrook, until 67, no? 67, 67, yeah. I was painting the final pictures, the, uh, uh, the flag is bleeding, and uh, the postage, United States postage stamp. Uh, um, commemorating the advent of black power. And those, those two. And then I wanted to paint my version of Guernica for us in America, because there was so much going on in the 60s, and none of it was being reported. Um, I mean, some of it might have been, but it was pretty much not told the spontaneous riots that were happening in the streets that I would see and be, you know, right there looking at it and I'd get home and it wouldn't be on TV, it wouldn't be on the radio or anything. So I said, that's my job to do that. And plus, having loved Guernica so much, and uh, I think I will um, do it as a tribute to Guernica uh, because I've always wanted to do some kind of a, a riot. Uh, and then Hale Woodruff said that my work didn't have rhythm. Because, you know, people used to like to complain about your work, <laughs> say what it didn't have. And so he was, uh, he kept me out of something. I think the first Fest Act. Kept me out of the first Fest Act. And when I told him, I want to come, why are you leaving me out? And he said, your work doesn't have any rhythm. And I said, let me show this man. I know rhythm. <laughs> I had fabulous teachers at City College. I know all about the rhythm. But I don't use it when I don't need it. I use it for, at my advantage, not just because I know it. So people are trying to tell you what to do. but you Well, all over the place, yes. People telling you what to do. But you said to hell with them, I'll do it my way. I'm going to do it my way. And so I, but I did say, I want to show him I know about rhythm, because mm. I know rhythm, come on. Anyway, I, um, <laughs> I, did, I did this painting of a spontaneous street riot called Die. And it was uh, very much inspired by Guernica. And I painted that picture. And in 1967, along with the United States uh, U.S. postage stamp and the flag is bleeding for this show that was going to be at the, the Spectrum Gallery uh, that Robert Newman, and he was wonderful also, uh, was going to give me. He gave me the keys to the gallery, the Spectrum Gallery on 57th Street uh, between 5th and 6th. Uh, and he gave me the keys to the gallery and said, go ahead, paint. Do, do whatever you want to do for the summer. And I sent the kids and my mother to Europe. She was a fashion show. She was a fashion, uh, she was a fashion designer. And um, I wanted them to see some parts of Europe. So I sent, her, sent them all there. And then I... Um, I moved away from my husband because he had some kitchen things he wanted me to do. <laughs> I mean, he had a whole plan for me. 
ah, I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. So I took my mother's keys, because she left the keys with me, and I kind of moved to her house, and I went every day to the gallery and painted. And I got those paintings done. Because I couldn't paint them at home because they were big. And I wanted to paint big paintings. Because everybody was painting huge, but abstract. And uh, we were going to have this show uh, in December, I think it was. And uh, I wanted to be ready. And since Robert Newman had given me the keys to the gallery, I said, oh my god, I've got to do this. I have no excuse. Um, and so I did, and I created Die. And it's now in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Yeah. Uh, I think it's after 50 years. They bought it in uh, 2017, is that right? Yeah, in 2017, and not only is it in the collection, we must also say that it's one of the most visited artworks in the yeah. entire museum. Whenever we go there, you know, in the preparation of the show, there are so many people in front of it, yeah. and it, it's amazing. Yeah, it, it takes time, though, you know, because uh, I've heard a lot of no's. And um, finally, 50 years, you get a yes. And uh, it's, it means you just have to keep trying. And you immediately... Anyone can you fly. All you got to do is try. <laughs> that is beautiful. Now, immediately after, you, of course, did the next uh, groundbreaking series, and that's, as those of you who will see the show or have seen the show can experience in the Serpentine, that's the second uh, big series in the show. It's the Black Light series from 1969. And when we discussed it uh, in the preparation of the show with Melissa Blanchflower, you told us that these works were different from the American people, because the American people were about the complicated interrelations of black and white people struggling with injustice, inequality, oppression, and fear. You said the Black Light series, which followed the American People series in 69, were a celebration of our newly recognized beauty. It was about an appreciation of blackness. Can you tell us about uh, the Black Light series from 69 and the connection to black power? Well. We were saying that word, and I can remember the time when <clears throat> saying the word black was feared by many black people. But we got around that, especially when, uh, what's his name? Stokely Carmichael. Stokely Carmichael yelled out, black power. Uh, we all got very excited because it was like a freedom of identity that we had achieved that we had never had before. And uh, even though we were only 9%, nine percent, no, we were 9%, not quite 10. <laughs> we were 9%, I mean 10, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I getting that nine from? <laughs> No, it was 10, I, but nine was stuck in my head somewhere. <laughs> okay, 10% of the population. And uh, so it was a very small group, but that doesn't matter. Uh, America was a land of freedom and so on. And these, we had so many leaders who were really willing to give their lives, and many of them did, because that's what you may have to do is to achieve freedom, you may have to give your lives, and a lot of people did. And you mentioned, um, uh, of course, Stokely Carmichael, and who used uh, actually the term um, uh, of black power in 66, and it then, of course, became a rallying cry across the US yes. in the late 60s. And that brings us also to the next chapter in the work and in the exhibition, which are your, your connections to activism, your amazing political posters in the late 60s 
early 70s. So you embraced feminism and became also an active member of women's movement. Can you tell us a little bit about these amazing political posters which we have in the show, mm -hmm. which were also actually, some of them unrealized projects, because actually they were not used uh, necessarily. Right. I made posters for the, the Panthers, and uh, I, I got, the, the Panthers had a, what? So many people who followed them and tried to raise money to help uh, so many of them who got arrested and uh, the jails were full of them for all different reasons. They, but they were trying to achieve the freedom that they felt was theirs because of being an American. And um, it was, it just got arrested and arrested and arrested. So Leonard Bernstein <clears throat> and several of his rich friends uh, had an organization that um, had a, a place in New York. <clears throat> and I did these posters to raise money. I thought he could, you know, use some of my paint posters to raise money. But so I went there, and but he, didn't like, he didn't like anything I had. And uh, he said, you've got our address, you, you've got our phone number, Everything on there. He said, look at, we're standing in a foot of water here, and uh, this is awful. I, I don't, uh, uh, no, no, none of those posters are in the show, though, are they? Yeah. They are? Not the Black Panther posters, the other posters are in the show. Yeah, other posters. Not those, yeah. Okay. And he said, you know, you, 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 yeah, what, what are you going to do about this? So I said, oh, that's terrible. I was trying to help you raise money. Uh, uh, with my posters. So he said, no. I said, well, what would you like to see? And he said, kill Whitey. I said, hmm. <laughs> you know, it was very interesting. You would ask people about political ideas, and they always went off track somewhere and uh, said something that didn't really make any sense for you know, any kind of freedom of any kind. Now, what does that got to do with what I'm trying to do? So I said, um, no, I, I don't think so. But I'll, I'll, I'll try to get something, and I'll, I'll come back. And so I went back, but they didn't like that, what I brought either. And uh, they, they wanted something impossible. I think they did not understand that political art is art. It's not some nothing that you make to throw away or to despise. Uh, Guernica, uh, Picasso didn't think of Guernica that way, and, and neither do I think of Die that way. <clears throat> it's something to give people to see, to think about to understand freedom and how important it is to all of us. And that's, of course, not only in your Black Panther posters, but also the United States of Attica is such an yeah. important poster. Can you tell us a little bit about, about <coughs> that and no. the genesis of the United States of... It's Attica. not the United States of America, but the United States of Attica. Yes, that was a prison that was just a mess. and. Uh, so I thought I would make a post. A lot of uh, uh, prisoners were getting murdered. A lot of bad things were happening at Attica. And um, I thought that I would make a poster of the United States. And in it and around it, I would, I would um, identify <coughs> the States and all the awful, <coughs> excuse me, is this a warden? Mm. Hmm? I would identify all the states of the Union and all the murders and horrors that they had had and how many people had died. 
And then around, I would have all the wars and how many people had died in those. So I hope you see that because it's a lot of research I did for that. And um, what did you ask me again? Yeah, you did the posters, but not only the posters <coughs> in that moment kind of, of activism, you, you also did demonstration. And the very famous demonstration was in front of the Whitney, where you basically ask uh, for women artists to be shown. And that, of course, was a collaboration with Michel, who is here. Mm -hmm. So I thought it would be great that you tell us about this collaborative uh, demonstration. Well, she was very young. What were you, 16 or something? Um, I wanted her to help me because we were trying to get more women into the art world. We had a, a, a wonderful program that we were doing and um, the Whitney had a program. It wasn't only women, it wasn't only women, was it? The um, the exhibition they used to have every year. The Whitney Biennial. Yeah, the Biennial. Yeah. It's yeah. every second. That wasn't year. only women. No. It was a Whitney Biennial. It wasn't only women, but they would have a few women in it, right? But no black women, right? Maybe none. And so I said, well, we're going to demand to be in that Whitney Biennial. So we have to give them a percentage, because that's what we did. We were into percentages. <laughs> so, Michelle, what percentage do you think we should give them for black women artists? And what'd you say? 50%. 50 I said, oh my goodness, this is terrible. This poor child <coughs> is, oh, this is no good. I, I have, uh, I don't know. I, I think maybe this is a little bit too much for her. 50%, oh gosh, I don't know. And I said, I can't let her be more on the case than me. So if she says 50, I'm going to go along with the 50. What the hell? And so I put the 50 on there. And because, uh, you know, you have to have the, po the posters and the different cards saying what you're uh, demonstrating about. And we were going to demonstrate against the Whitney for not having any African American women in it. And, and as a result of our demonstration, we got two, three, something like that. Okay, so we got two out of 23 percent. But this year, after all those years, there is now 50 percent women. <laughs> so you see, sometimes it takes us a while. It's not always that quick. And that idea also that nothing could stop you, that in a very DIY way, in a do-it-yourself way, mm -hmm. you would uh, always um, make art public, is of course what is so amazing throughout the trajectory, not only in the paintings, not only through your exhibitions, through your activism, through your curating, but also through your writing. And uh, in the exhibition, there is a lot of your writing, and the writing, of course, is part of the story quilts. Now, it's very fascinating that your story quilts actually began with a autobiography. We flew over the bridge, we have the book here. And for those of you who haven't read it, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. It's the memoirs of uh, Faith Ringgold. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it was a situation where the publisher kind of tried to tell you what to do and um, yeah. wouldn't publish the book. 
and then you just did it by actually coming up with this medium, the story quiz. Can you tell us a little bit about how that all began and how from the unpublished, initially <laughs> unpublished, we flew over the bridge, you came to this amazing medium of the story quiz, which we can see. Well, at the she said, uh, this is not your story. And I, I said, oh my goodness. First she said, had said before that she was going to publish my book. I don't know why she just looked at me and decided my book was going to be one way. And it wasn't that way. So when I did give her my autobiography, uh, growing up in Harlem and going to City College and becoming an artist and all the trials and tribulations, she um, decided that that's not your story. Because most of the writers, black women writers, who had written their stories at that time, or were writing stories that <clears throat> of all the horrors their lives had brought them. Well, I'm sorry, my life had not been a horror. I hadn't gotten raped and thrown out the window and beat up and all that. That didn't happen to me. Uh, so what am I supposed to do, make that up so I can get published? And maybe some of them did that too. I don't know. And what gave you the idea but then I with decided the story? I want to tell my story. And what gave you the idea then to do it as a story quilt? How did that? Well, how can I get published? How can I get my word out there? And the way to do it is to write it on my art. Write it. Nobody can stop me from doing that. I do have freedom of speech in that regard. And I'm going to get that book published. Now, it took me about, what, 15 years, maybe? I'm not sure. What was it, 15? Yeah, it took me about 15 years writing on art and projecting my uh, opinions on different artworks that I had made. and. Um, to get it published by not that same person, by an, another publisher. And later on... It's the Duke University Press. Duke, Duke University Press yeah. published, because the publisher will, will publish you, and then it will go out of print. <coughs> it was originally published by Balfinch Press. What? Bullfinch Press. Bullfinch Press. Yeah. And, um, oh, that was so wonderful. Uh, a woman who had written a book on me uh, had heard about this problem, and she introduced me to the Bullfinch Press people. And uh, I, that's how I finally got it published. But writing all over my art uh, was also very beneficial. And because uh, I've, I've, I've published 23 uh, children's books and I don't know how many other books. Uh, and it all began with this one. And the children books are also incredibly relevant. And we discussed that a lot preparing the exhibition because of course your work through all the different dimension it has reaches out to the world. And that's something we believe a lot in at the Serpent Time, because not only do we have free admission you know, for one million yeah. visitors every year, but we think that that's not enough. And we did the Arthur Jaffer exhibition. Arthur Jaffer said, we cannot just count on people coming through the door, because there is still a door. Yeah. So we need to actually go outside the door, into the park, into the communities, and, and, and. And now, also into different other boroughs, which is why we do this project with Parking Dagenham. Wow. Um, so Arthur Jaffer said, this is very urgent, but of course, also to disseminate art, mm -hmm. uh, so that many encounters can happen outside museum spaces. And children mm -hmm. books are a great way of doing so, because mm -hmm. I mean, so many million of children grew up with your books. And that again became, began with a story quilt. Can you tell us about how you came to children books and what it means for you to do these children books? And I also wanted to ask you about the newest one, what you know, you're working on now, if there is a new children book you're doing at the moment. The first children's book was Torah Beach. 
and Tar Beach came about because uh, my editor, um, Andrea Cascardi, um, was in her doctor's office and she saw a poster of Tar Beach the quilt, painted, huh? and read the words that I had put on it because I was writing all over everything. So she got a chance by looking at the art to read the story. And she called me up and she said, I'm at my doc a doctor, you don't know me, but I am a, uh, an editor at Random House and I want to uh, call you and talk to you about publishing this story, Tor Beach. Um, what do you think? And I said, I was totally unprepared because at City College, they've never taught us anything about illustration. As a matter of fact, at the time, if you were an illustrator, you were not considered an artist. That was, uh, what kind of what was that? Co commercial art or something. And um, I said, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna turn any requests like that down. I'm taking that. <laughs> they want me to do a children's book out of Tar Beach, because it was, it had a, ch a children's uh, slant to it. It was fine. Um, and I could illustrate. I knew I could, and I did. And so I said yes, because I don't think you turn down opportunities. That's not smart. And I, I, I did that book. It was my first book, and it just went on and on. And now, and what's on. the most recent one? Can you tell us about? The, first most, the, re the, the most recent one is we came to America, and that is uh, the one I just finished, and I'm, I've got another one <coughs> that is coming up, and it is the children forgot to play. Yeah, that one's going to come up too. And can you tell us what, what they are about, these two most recent well, children books? Things had gotten so bad in America that people didn't know what to do. And they were, till, till they, what they did was they got in bed, some little children, and they went to sleep and refused to wake up the next morning. Now, you know, <coughs> that's horror. And come to find out, it wasn't just the children in these kids' house, these, the, the, the stars of the book, but it was all over the world. Children were refusing to get out of bed. And the parents were, oh, they were going crazy because that is a no-no. And... Um, out of all of that came the story of what was happening in the world. And so I, I get to change it uh, by having the children finally make demands on how the world should be and the adults having to listen. So that one will come out at some point when I, I get finished with it, huh? Yeah, because I had an editor that just took it and turned it upside down, so. <laughs> Upset then, me a lot. <laughs> and not only uh, do you do children books, but also you did a game, and that's of course another wonderful way mm -hmm. of doing art for, mm -hmm. for everyone. And I was actually thinking about that uh, the other day, you know, because we, we spoke to Tim Berners-Lee, who mm -hmm. invented the World Wide Web in 1989, and he, 
he sort of said the World Wide Web as an invention was always that it should be for everyone. And he felt very bad about the fact that now net neutrality is in danger and that we have a fast internet eventually for people who pay and a slower internet for people who don't pay. So he said we have to fight the loss of net neutrality because this is for everyone. And your art is for everyone and you reach yeah. out to so many people. So you did a game even, and I'm very fascinated by this game because you were inspired by the Japanese number game, Sudoku, but you didn't make Sudoku, you made Quiltuduko. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you to tell us about Quiltuduko. Well, Quiltuduko is instead of nine numbers, it's nine images and nine colors. Uh, because after you, I love Sudoku, and but after you do it, it's over. You go on to the next. Whereas with my game, after you get the nine colors and nine images in their proper spaces, uh, you uh, you can have a. A post, you can print it up and make a poster out of it. Hang it on your wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you use digital technology for that, no? It, what? You worked with the computer. On yeah, that. because I like I like to figure things out. I like to use that mm -hmm. that technique that that he has of making uh, nine columns, nine boxes, and nine. Um, what do you call it? Rows? No, it's nine rows. Nine rows, nine colors. I mean, no color. Well, yeah, colors. I have the colors, too, in mine. <clears throat> For each one of the nine boxes of nine. And I have the colors and the uh, imagery, the design aspects. Because I miss that when I'm playing that game, because I love art and color and designs, and it's fun. It's more fun to me to do it that way. So we have the children book, we have the game, and then of mm -hmm. course there is also, in terms of art for all and reaching out, there is the public commissions. You did many public commissions. Oh my God. Um, yeah. An early one was in the early 70s, the very famous public commission for the women's house. Can you tell us about, about that? Before then talking about the more recent public commission. For the women's house. <clears throat> um, let's see. Oh, for the women's house, yes. Oh my goodness. Uh, I wanted to do something for the women's jail. The wi what, what do they call it? The women's house of detention in, on Rikers Island? Yeah, and I wanted to help them because it seemed that young, young, young women were going to prison and they were, some of them were even pregnant and the babies would be born in prison and they would take the babies away from them and, and they wouldn't see them. It, it was just so horrible. And um, so we formed uh, some kinds of groups to go there and talk to the women and do stuff. But I said, I want to give them a painting that um, I think could really give the women something to look forward to. And I had been given, uh, oh, about $4,000 by the Creative Artists Public Service Commission. They were giving money out to different people <clears throat> to do something for the community. And I thought, well, I'm not going to go teach or anything like that with the money. I'm going to make this painting, and I'm going to offer it to the museum, I mean, to the prison, and uh, have it there to inspire the women. Because women, there were so many things women were not allowed to do in those days, including driving a, a bus, uh, playing sports, being an athlete, uh, 
playing in a band, music, beating drums, and so on. And I wanted them to realize there's a lot more important things they could be doing as women other than what they were doing that landed them in that jail. And you know what some of it was. So <clears throat> I got it together. I, I, as a matter of fact, I want to say that I asked them, what, what would you like to see in this painting that I'm going to do to inspire you? in the prison while you're here. And one girl said, I want to see a long road leading out of here. And I said, well, hmm. <laughs> anyway, we um, finished that. I did the painting. And uh, it was in the, uh, the, the um, prison. And it was um, installed in there in a way that Nobody could, we thought, no one could figure out how to get it down. The Whitney had done it. Some installer from the Whitney Museum had come there and installed this painting, which was um, six by eight feet, I think. Mm -hmm. So it was big. And um, eight by eight feet, maybe, yeah. And I uh, had installed this painting in a way that you just couldn't figure out how to detach it from the wall. Except that um, somebody did. <laughs> and it, you see, it went, the painting went from the women's house of detention to the men's, men's prison, which, and they didn't move the inmates, the women's inmates, were moved from the women's house of detention. And the painting stayed. And the painting stayed when the men came in, and they, it wasn't for them. It had nothing to do with them, actually. And it should have been moved when the women moved. But I guess they couldn't get it down. <laughs> so, <clears throat> They got it down. The men decided they were tired of looking at these bitches. And they got it down off the wall after the women were gone, and it was just the guys there. <clears throat> and they, I think they painted over it first with white. They couldn't get it off the wall. They painted over it with white house paint, because it was an oil painting. And then they had to get it off the wall and hide it, because then they were going to have to say who had done the painting on top. So it just became very, and, and the guy who, um, who had done the painting over, or one other one, I don't know, had decided that if he got it down off the wall, he could paint something. But when he got it down off the wall, it, it be, seemed even bigger than it was, eight by eight feet. And um, he, he couldn't do anything. Uh, so they took it down in the basement to try to figure out how to get rid of it, to destroy the evidence. In the meantime, one of the guards called me on the phone and said, told me what happened, and said, you better do something quick, because they're trying to figure out how to destroy this painting, because it's a problem as long as it's around. So I called the warden. The warden was not interested. She said, we have people dying and all kinds of things happening here, getting killed, and uh, we don't have time to worry about a painting? No, we're not interested. Okay, so I call the superintendent of correction, right? 
superintendent of correction. And he said, <clears throat> I gotta get his name though. He said, I'll take care of it. And he went there and he called me to come and look at the painting, all painted over in White House paint. Because oil painting underneath, you can paint over with White House paint. And you'll never get that painting off in a way that you can save, never get the white paint off in a way that you can save the painting underneath. So the painting is destroyed. OK, so um, he raised $25,000 to get it restored. And I just think he was so wonderful. He had it rest it's restored. Of course, it took a year to do it because it was restored in little, tiny little, uh, what, postage stamp sizes. So it finally got restored. And, uh, and then it went back to, it went to the women's house of detention, yes. And they put it way up in the ceiling <laughs> with bars. <laughs> oh, it was so crazy. And I said, no, I, you can't do that. And so they let it go to an exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum. And that was nice. And the Brooklyn Museum wanted to keep it. They agreed to keep it. But the prison decided they wanted their painting back. So we couldn't do anything about that, except that somebody else wanted it for an exhibition. And so it went there, and then we finally lost it back to, it's not the Women's House of Detention. Yeah, it is the Women's House of Detention. <clears throat> we went, it's back there. Now we don't know what's happening with it. We, uh, the Brooklyn Museum said they would take it. They would definitely take it, because it's not safe there. Okay, so we, we're trying to get to see it, because we haven't seen it yet, now that it has gone back to the prison. That pain, and the painting was uh, done in a Cuba style, with eight different <clears throat> characterizations of women doing things that women were not allowed to do at the time. Being teachers and uh, driving taxi cabs, I think. But they couldn't do that either. And um, being, being athletes is big because now they're doing it athletes and uh, being uh, musicians, playing instruments in bands. Um, these were, and be, how about being president of the United States? I put that one in there. They, they, they haven't done it yet, but they're gonna do it. It's coming up. <clears throat> what an amazing story. And then of course, there are the public artworks which are very visible in which one can go. For those of you who want to visit them, you can see them anytime, any day. And these are your subway stations. Yes. You told us earlier this wonderful sentence, anyone can fly, all you got to do is try. Now, in uh, the subway, actually, of 125th Street, it's the station of 125th Street in New York City, there are these flying mosaics. Can, mm -hmm. can you tell us about <laughs> the genesis of that? Well, they were all people who I knew living in Harlem. Uh, really um, fantastic people. Could I see that picture? Yeah. They were fantastic, all the wonderful, wonderful uh, musicians, Ella Fitzgerald, the Four Ink Spots. Um, uh, and um, oh my goodness, look at all of this. Joe Lewis uh, in the sports world. And in the, uh, the what, the, the place where they were seen, uh, the, the Apollo Theater, huh? and, and the other, there's another theater there, but it's too small, I can't see the name of it. And um, it, it's on 125th Street in Harlem. And 
I got an opportunity to make the picture that was made into a mosaic in Venice, Italy. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then underneath, and there is the one from in LA, and which we also can visit, should we ever be in LA. Yes. It's the Los Angeles metro station downtown, and uh, that, there there are 52 glass mosaics, or 52 right. different characters, right? It's, uh, 52 uh, glass mosaic characters of people being musicians and uh, being artists and doing lots of things that, that people uh, would like to do themselves as they walk along the subway, they can see themselves mm -hmm. in the imagery that I have made here. Um, and there's 52 of them. Now, they used to call upon artists to come and, um, what? And uh, uh, try to win an award at something. So each artist would come with an idea of what they were gonna do. And I had won the 125th Street one. As I came with my, all my images done. And I found out that that's the way. You want to show them just exactly what it is you plan to do. Some people came with a long story. They were going to do this and that and the other. And they were going to, oh boy, were they going to do this and that. <laughs> and they didn't get over. I came with my pictures of what I was going to do. I'm going to let them see because the architects who are the ones who are going to vote for you, they don't want you uh, scribbling on their architecture. They want to see what you're going to do to put on the walls that they've made. And it's very important that you can show them what it is you have in mind. And so I had to make the 52 imageries for LA. And, and when you go there in LA, <clears throat> it, it, it looks like a private, it looks like a gallery that ha is having a show, doesn't it? You've seen it, haven't you, Dorian? Maybe you haven't. Where's the, uh, you have, yeah. oh, she's from California, yeah. It's amazing, because nobody rides the subway in L.A., right? <laughs> Who rides the subway? That's fantastic that they even built a subway there. <laughs> nobody ever there. Everybody Except my paintings, I mean my mosaics. <laughs> 52 of them. <laughs> Anyway, for those of you who haven't been to the exhibition, I hope you can all come and see the show at the Serpentine and, of course, to see uh, the subway station in 125th Street in New York City mm -hmm. and in Los Angeles. So we have a triangle here, two, two subway stations mm -hmm. and an exhibition to see. I want to open it to all of your questions. I have one last question for you, mm -hmm. uh, Faith, which is actually the Rainer Maria Rilke question, um, because uh, I think it's very fascinating that... Uh, so many uh, artists uh, of many different generations, younger artists, are so, are so inspired uh, by you. This is also actually how we uh, made the first visit in New York two years ago and visited you, because artists told us about your work and how urgent it is to visit you. Lynette Yadon-Boak, was actually the first artist who told us at the Southern Time and we worked with her on an exhibition that, uh, you know, we should make a, a studio visit. And that has always been the methodology, you know, to listen uh, to artists. And at the same time, I think it's so fascinating, Rainer Maria Rilke's idea of advice to a young poet. And I see that many young artists are here today. So I was wondering what would be in 2019 your advice to a young artist? Well, you, you really do have to uh, recognize the fact <clears throat> that there's no uh, secret to attaining any kind of prominence in the art world. You have to work hard at what it is you're doing. And if they don't like it now, don't worry about it. 
uh, they'll come around later. I mean, don't change looking to see how you're going to please people. That's the thing you can't do as far as I can see. I tried it. I can't please anybody. Um, yes, I did everything I could to, to please the, the people who owned my husband's uh, barbershop, what, back in the 50s? Yeah, 50s. And uh, they didn't like anything. And I said, Bertie, um, they don't like my pictures. I wanted to give it to them because they would hang them up in the barbershop. And they don't like them. So he said, um, I said, so what would you suggest? I, I'd like to do something they like. And he said, mm, make a clown. I wish I had that clown here. They didn't like it either. So I, that cured me. No, don't try to please people. Please yourself. That's the key. Please yourself. And eventually, you will be successful at that. Please yourself. You love it. Look at it. You did it. You made it. You love it? It's yours. <laughs> this is beautiful advice. Faith, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? We take questions, yeah. Huh? Are they going to take them now? Yeah, we can now open it uh, to your questions for Face Ringer. We have a question here. Do we have a microphone? Yeah, we have a question here in the middle. If we can have the microphone. Yeah, microphone is coming. Thank you very much. I'm Rodney Reynolds and was at Howard University when you were working on the Tar Beach series, and I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you gave me and my fellow artists at the time a vocabulary, and you helped us to develop a language. And so, thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. We have a question here, yeah, on the left. Um, hello, uh, my name is Christina Yene. I'm a curator and I've, um, uh, my focus is on women artists, uh, particularly from a uh, black cultural background, black cultural background. Um, I was just wondering um, what's your take or, or maybe if you've had the, the chance to engage with a um, black British artist. Um, I was just wondering whether, whether your, your visit here to the UK has given you this opportunity, or if not, what's your take on the recognition? Uh, I'm thinking of people like uh, Lubaina Hamid, who won the Turner Prize in 2017, and how it's taken time for uh, mainstream institutions to recognize uh, black, black artists and black women artists. I, I didn't hear the last question about black artists. What was that? What? What? The question but is about your engagement and if I understand connection uh, to uh, black British artists uh, in general, I, I suppose, I and during this visit also. That's what you meant, right? Yeah. I don't know the connection there. I don't really know anything about that. I haven't. Let me see. What do I know about that? Nothing. I don't think I know anything about that. I have not, I haven't met any black British artists. I don't know. I'm sure I must have through the life of myself. <laughs> but I, I don't You think had a long conversation yesterday with Lynette Yadombrake at the uh, Over Lunch, mm -hmm. who is an amazing artist. So you had a long conversation. I did. Yeah. 
<laughs> and she's an artist. Amazing artist, yeah. And did we talk about her experience as an artist? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know because I, uh, I introduced you and then you talked for a long time, but I wasn't there when you talked. So. Oh, well, there. <laughs> I, I don't recall. I don't know the situation, how difficult it might be. I think I know a few British men artists. Yes. Uh, but I don't know about their difficulties. I know they must have some, but I don't know what they are. So I am not aware. But also you have not exhibited here. This is your first exhibition yeah, in, it is, huh? in London. I mean, that might also yeah, I guess so. play a role because you haven't been here and haven't exhibited here. I have been here many times, but as you say, I haven't exhibited here. Mm. So it's a, a new uh, experience for me. And I'm trying to think, I do know some British artists that are black, yes. But I think they're all men. I think so. I think you are right. I mean, you're not saying that. I am. <laughs> I don't, I don't we, know. We can take one or two more questions. Hello. Hello, my name is Monica, and um, I'm fascinated by the uh, depiction of quilts in your work. Where are you, Monica? Oh, I'm here. OK. Um, and could you talk a little bit about um, quilting in the context of your art and, and how it might have influenced you and, and brought, how did you bring it into your work? And uh, why did I bring it into my work? The quilts, yeah. Yeah, because it was a way of creating imagery uh, with painting, because I'm a painter, that I could make a painting as big as I wanted to and roll it, fold it, and pick it up myself. And that was what I was trying to do. I was trying to get my work seen everywhere. And it was getting more and more difficult the larger my work got because the, the, the the quilt, I mean, the canvas on stretcher bars is heavy. And the bigger you make the, the canvas on stretcher bars, the heavier it gets. And I wanted to make my work bigger and bigger. And, and it got to the place where I couldn't pick it up. So, and I said, this is crazy. I mean, you know, I gotta wait till my husband comes home from work to pick up my art and take it someplace, that, that doesn't make any sense. I had to wait until he came home to pick up the art to get it downstairs or get Barbara and Michelle to walk it down the stairs because it was too big to go in on the elevator. And uh, I said, you, you gotta do something about this. And, and so uh, I went from the Tonkas to the quilts until I could make them as big as I liked and roll them up and, uh, and have no problem. Because as a woman artist, you have to be able to manage yourself. Or you can get an assistant maybe, but you can't depend on your husband to Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked this question about the quilts, because we did talk a lot about you know, the story quilts, uh, but we didn't talk that much about actually how you came to quilts. And your very first quilt, you told me in New York, uh, when we did the, uh, the interview during Freeze Week, that actually um, was a collaboration with your, your model, with Willie mm -hmm. Posey, uh, Echoes of Harlem. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, yeah. you made Mother's Quilt. So maybe it's interesting that you talk a little bit about these very early quilts, no? Okay, the very first one, uh, 
echoes of Hall. Oh, we don't have that here, do we? No. See, I have a lot of work, so you can't have it all, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, because quilt making is all over the world, there is nowhere you can go where the people don't create quilts, where the women, and it's mostly women. Although in New York, it was a lot of guys that were making quilts. Uh, in the, what, 70s, 80s, what was it, 90s? 70s, 80s, I think. I started in the 80s. I think they may have started in the 70s, 80s. And they got over because it didn't matter somehow what they were making because their work was more acceptable. Um, it's had a long history and maybe eventually, you know, I'll be able to write something about it. <coughs> but I believe it came here um, with the slave, uh, slave movement um, because the slaves made them uh, and could make them easily because it was a form of art and they couldn't make the forms of art that they could make in Africa. You can't come here painting nothing or, or making sculptures or what's the other thing they did a lot of uh, sculpture, masks, you can't make any, none of that. But what they could do was make quilts. And because that could keep them warm and it could keep the master warm. So that was fine. And it's, it's a, a, a medium that is all over the world. And I have researched it. Each group of people can do it in their you know, with their vision from where they come from. And they are beautiful. Uh, beautifully done in a lot of countries all over the world. <clears throat> so, um, what, what was that? Did I answer that question? Yeah, it was perfect okay. for us to talk about it. We can take one last question. I think there's a question. Okay. What was that? Hi, my name's Whitney. I'm a psychotherapist, so the art world is very new to me. But what I was interested in is you speak about doing the work and continuing to do the work. So how did you psychologically get in a space where you were able to still produce work given the political climate, racial climate, back then and still now, unfortunately? What was that? <laughs> No, she, I didn't understand because... Could you repeat it? It's quite difficult for us to hear it. Okay. Yeah. The acoustic, so if you could speak louder, it would be great. Okay, so I'm a psychotherapist. Psychotherapist. I'm a psychotherapist. And you've mentioned a lot about doing the work and most importantly, keep doing the work. So I'm quite interested, how have you been able to get into a psychological space to produce the work, given your environment you know, the racial climate, political climate, injustice, brutality, which is still present this day? I still don't understand the question. How can you continue to work with the psychological what? Where is, where is she? How, I'm over here. Is he just either on the right? So I guess the impact of living in a climate with racism and injustices. Where, where are you? Raise your hand. Yeah. In the very back, on the, on the right-hand side. If okay. You yeah, yeah. Why don't you stand you up? You guys understand Good. the question. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So how have you been able to still do the work given the injustices, the environment that, you know, we live in, you lived in? How were you still able to produce that work? Well, nobody's gonna actually stop me. Yeah, okay, that's, that's what I'm on. Yeah. 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 No, I don't think so. They will, they can stop me from showing the work, yes. 
uh, yeah, they could stop me. They have stopped me from showing the work. But eventually, I'm going to get through because I'm going to be persistent. And everybody is not. There's always going to be somebody who's going to break the rule. You have to continue to be diligent. You have to, you just have to be determined. You can't expect that everybody's gonna love you just because you're here, because it's not gonna happen. And you have to persist. And eventually, somebody is gonna be interested in what it is you're doing. That's, as far as I can see from all the people that I know who are artists and who have different stories that I'm familiar with, uh, persistence is exceedingly important. Because each work of art, each person pursues art in a different way. It's, it's an original concept. You know, it's not as if, oh, they should do it this way because this way is the way that it works. You know, that's not about what it is. It's your visual expression done in your way through your eyes about what you see out of your eyes. It's totally and completely free to your choices. Now, some people don't have any visual choices. So they're not artists, they're not gonna be artists. But if you really want to be an artist and you have the choice of wanting to commemorate and preserve what you see, and you are persistent about it, we will catch it. You just have to keep. Anyone can fly. All you got to do is try. You really have to be persistent. Faith, thank so, you so, so much. That could not be a more wonderful conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another big round of applause for